All right, about 30 more seconds and we'll have people jumping in. Uh, I'm trying something different tonight. Instead of a webinar, this is a Zoom class session so that people can actually see each other and ask questions. And if you want to make your camera available or not, that's just fine. That's just fine. You participate however best works for you. But I'm experimenting with this. I didn't promote this session as heavily as I usually do because this is a little bit of an experiment to try a Zoom classroom, just like I'm talking to students for this webinar session. And along the way, if you want to ask a question, just go down to the little uh, uh, thing at the bottom and uh, uh, raise your hand or ask it in the chat if you want. Uh, and I'll try to answer questions, call on you as we see you, as I see the questions. So feel free, pretend you're sitting in a classroom or sitting having coffee with the silly bald man. That's fine. So today's topic, and we'll start right now, it is 6.02 is comprehensive instruction and interventions for reading. Let's define what that is. But I do cite my sources, and these are my two latest books related to reading instruction. People often ask me to cite my sources or list my sources. I tend not to do it. I'll cite some of them here. But we are going to present some information. We're going to address the question, what is balanced literacy or a balanced reading program. Oftentimes when people speak against something and against balanced literacy, they don't really know or understand what balanced literacy is or a comprehensive approach to reading instruction. You will leave tonight knowing exactly what it is. These are some of the components of a balanced literacy program. And we're gonna go over 10 of the essential ones. And if we have time, what should be in a reading intervention as well. But the big idea is that skills-based instruction should be balanced with experiences to practice those skills in authentic reading and writing contexts. Just like when I'm coaching my wrestlers, yes, we do some skills, but they need to practice those skills in authentic wrestling context. That's called whole to part, part to whole learning. But a balanced approach to reading is not a standardized approach. It does not look the same in every classroom. In every classroom, there is a continuum between a purely skills-based approach and a meaning-based approach. And since students and classrooms and teachers are not standardized products, that, that approach is always sliding. That continuum where you're at is sliding. Some students need more of this. Some students need more of that. But students are not standardized products. So when people say balanced reading, there is no singular approach called balanced reading. It essentially says that reading must have a proper balance of these things, and they left out a couple, of few, uh, a couple of these, and I'll address them tonight. But there should be balance. What is the proper balance? Whatever your students need, that is a proper balance. And in a balanced reading program, very direct, and very explicit instruction is used to teach comprehension, word identification and recognition, phonics and phonemic awareness, vocabulary, and writing. Absolutely. So the idea that balanced literacy does not use explicit instruction or does not teach phonics is an ununderstanding of what balanced literacy is or a comprehensive reading program. Well, let's turn to the National Reading Panel before I get to the 10 pillars of comprehensive reading instruction. What do they say about balanced literacy instruction? Well, they said if you focus too much on the teaching of letter sound relationships and not enough on putting them to use, the program's unlikely to be effective. 
Students need to apply their skills in daily, daily reading and writing. That's not me, that's the National Reading Panel. Programs that focus too much on phonics with little time spent practicing, like reading books, are likely to be ineffective. And this is directly quoted. Systematic phonics instruction should be integrated with other reading instruction to create a balanced reading program. So many of the science of reading advocates are against balanced reading. It's important to know what balanced reading is and to know that the National Reading Panel, which is the most sciency of science of reading, recommends balanced reading. Phonics should not become the dominant component in a reading program, neither in the amount of time devoted nor the significance attached. So, an overview. Overview, total, complete. We are going to look at a comprehensive reading, a comprehensive approach to reading instruction. Comprehensive means total or complete to reading instruction or literacy instruction. It includes the big five from the National Reading Panel report, but the big five was five pillars short. So consider these the big 10. And I'm gonna say up front, everyone believes in the explicit teaching of phonics for emergent and beginning readers. Everybody does. It's not the what, it's the how and the how much. The reading wars, well, there really wasn't a reading war. It was more like a coup, but that's off the subject. Here are the 10 pillars. We're gonna look at each one of these and please feel free to ask your questions. First of all, phonemic awareness. Phoneme is identifying and manipulating sounds, the ability to hear a sound within a word, breaking it into parts, putting the sounds together. And generally, this is discontinued after students are reading comfortably at reading level one. Now, there's strong correlational research, meaning students that score highly on phonemic awareness tests in kindergarten tend to have uh, achieved more later on in first and second grade. But we don't know if that's correlational or causal. Was the high scoring in phonemic awareness a result of being exposed to books and language at home? Thus, it's not the phonemic awareness scores as much as the exposure to books that causes that achievement. So I'm not saying you should ignore phonemic awareness, but let's put its importance as one part of a comprehensive reading program for emergent and beginning readers, preschool, kindergarten, and maybe some students need it in first grade. Maybe. Should never be done in third grade and above. Phonics instruction. Everybody believes that phonics instruction is important. Whether you teach balanced literacy, whether you teach whole language, absolutely. Phonics is included in whole language. Whether you use a basal, whether you use a skills-based approach, Everyone believes that beginning readers, emergent and beginning readers, need phonics instruction. It should be systematic and it should be explicitly taught. It's not the what of phonics instruction, it's the how you teach it and how much you teach it. This idea that you can teach phonics to all students in the same way, some students need very little phonics instruction, some students need more. It's important to know the students sitting in front of you. And as I said, National Reading Panel reports that phonics should not be the exclusive focus of a reading program. And the results were inconclusive after first grade. This is exactly what they said. Its impact on comprehension is limited. And that's why we read, to comprehend things, to understand what we're reading. Phonics instruction contributed only weekly, if at all, in helping poor readers apply these skills to read actual texts. Hmm. You teach it over there and they use it over there, but there's a weak 
linkage, the transfer effect is not very strong. Again, this does not mean you don't teach them, but understand it in a context. Insufficient data to draw any conclusions about the effects of phonics instruction with normally developing readers above grade one. Insufficient data. Phonics instruction fails to exert a statistically significant impact on poor readers in grades two through six. Yet what happens? Kid is struggling, we give them more phonics. There are several ways to teach phonics, and then according to the National Reading Panel Report, each is equally effective. And if I were teaching, I would use a little of all of these. Synthetic phonics is what we normally think of when we think of traditional approaches to phonics. Synthesis, putting things together, putting letter sounds together to create words. Absolutely. Analytic, analyzing what's there. Seeing words in print. What word ends with the d, d sound? What's the beginning sound in the middle of this word? Can you find the word that starts with the a sound? Analyzing words in print. Embedded phonics, embedded in the context of real reading. With young children, that's often in big books where you stop and you're doing Dave the Duck day and you practice the d, d sound. And analogy phonics or large analogy phonics or large unit phonics, looking for letter patterns, things you recognize, phonograms, morphemes, that's called large unit phonics, onset rhymes, beginning and uh, beginning sounds and phonograms, sometimes called word building, and phonics through spelling. According to the National Reading Panel report, each is equally effective. The third part, and this one's a little controversial, so I want to make sure we're all perfectly clear. The third element in a comprehensive approach to reading instruction are activities to develop all three neurocognitive word recognition systems. Sometimes this is called a cueing system, and that is misunderstood. A cueing system is not an approach. We don't teach children to use the cueing system. It's not a strategy. It's not a skill. Let's understand what a cueing system is. It's a recognition that the brain uses interacting and interconnecting systems to recognize words while reading. And I'm going to differentiate recognize from identify words in just a minute. But interacting, we use them together, interconnecting, phonological, letter sounds, yes. Semantic, that means context or meaning, yes. Syntactic, that means grammar or word order, yes. Schematic, that is knowledge. Your background knowledge is used to help you identify words, yes and pattern recognition. We use these, they're interconnecting, working together. Now, as I said, recognizing words is different from identifying. And confusion here leads to a lot of the controversy and the debate and the discussion. So let's clear that up once and for all. Recognizing a word is your reading, you see it in print, it's in your mental lexicon, the dictionary in your head, and you instantly know what it is. And I'm guessing most of you recognized all the words in this sentence. You saw it and you instantly knew what that word was. Recognize. To identify a word, this is a strategy that you'll have to consciously employ. And I will get to this a little bit more in a minute. Word recognition systems, cueing systems, again, it's not a strategy or an approach. It's not a method. We don't teach children to use cueing systems. That's not what a cueing system is. It's a recognition 
that our brain uses three or four interacting systems to recognize words as we're reading, to see them and automatically know what they are. Now, I know some of you think I'm a silly little bald man. Okay, I'm going to give a little demo. I'm going to show you 110 words, and I want you to read them as quickly as you can. Okay, and go. And stop. Not all of you got through all of them, and that's fine. Okay. Now, if you see these words again, you should be able to read them faster, I would think, and smoother and more fluently. All right, I'm going to show you the same 110 words. See if you can read them faster this time. Are you ready? And go. Whoa, what, what, what am I doing? The same words. The same words. What did you know us about your speed? about your fluency, about your eye movement. I'm guessing many of you read word by word like this, whereas the first one, most of your eyes were going smoothly back and forth like that. If reading were purely sounding out words, you would be able to read that as quickly and easily as that. But this one, you're using background knowledge, you're using grammar word order, you're using semantics as well as phonics to help you read and understand. Here, you have phonics. You have only one of the queuing systems. So it's a recognition, three queuing systems that we use all three and we have to have activities to develop all three. All right, the fourth element, activities and instruction related to word identification. Now remember, word recognition was seeing a word in print and automatically knowing what it is. To identify a word, this is a strategy, something you have to consciously employ. You're reading and you see a word that you do not recognize. It's in your lexicon, the dictionary in your head, but you do not recognize it. So you need to employ a conscious strategy in order to recognize it, to identify what that word is. And there are four word identification strategies. Analogy is word families or large unit phonics or uh, it, looking for parts of the word patterns that you recognize. And the human brain naturally looks for patterns. Do you see a part of that word that you recognize? Try it and see if it makes sense. Morphemic awareness or morphemic analysis. Morpheme is the smallest unit of meaning in a word. Uh, so it's usually prefix, suffix, affix, and root. Do you see a part of that word that you recognize? You know what it means. Context clues, semantics, what makes sense within the sentence. And phonics, decoding, absolutely. We should teach all four of these using very direct and very explicit instruction, step by step using direct instruction, input, modeling, guided practice, independent practice. Absolutely. We teach the strategy to develop the skill. We teach this strategy so that students begin to do this automatically as they're reading. And I wanna say one more thing about this. I was working with a third grade girl, we'll call her Sally. <clears throat> it was on the computer and she was reading. She would come to a word that she didn't recognize. She began to try to identify it by going letter by letter and sounding it out and I could see her but all right and it took her about 10 seconds or so to do all that once she sounded it out then she tested it to see if it made sense 
So I, I told her a trick. I said, well, why don't you just say blank and let your eyes bounce on both sides of the words and see and just keep moving on. She did that and usually within two seconds, she would come back and she would know what that word was. 10 seconds or two seconds. Two seconds is better for comprehension. And I'll show you some activities to develop uh, uh, semantic cueing. I'll show you some, some uh, strategies in just a minute. Daily reading practice. Instead of reading practice or reading class, we should call it reading practice. Yes, instruction is necessary, but children need to practice reading in order to get better. If you're learning to play the piano, you certainly practice every day. If you're learning to read, you need to practice every day so that you can use the skills you learned in an authentic way reading context. How else are they going to transfer from here to there? Every day, daily reading practice. And you're saying, how much? Daily reading practice. How much? Well, there is a strong research base, and I'll get to the how much in just a minute, for daily reading practice. Enhancing comprehension, word identification, and fluency, vocabulary, and conceptual knowledge. These are just some of the sources cited here. Everyday reading practice. The best thing you can do for your students, if you're a parent, reading every day at night, even if it's five or ten minutes. If you're a teacher, daily reading practice. Everyone reads. Five minutes, 20 minutes is better. 30 minutes is even better. Yeah depending on the age. Now, Nancy Atwell recommends 70 to 80% of reading class or reading practice be used for self-selected reading practice and only 20 to 30 for skills work. And I posit that it's usually the other way around. 70 to 80% in skills instruction. And we say, well, when you get your work done, then you can read a book. However, reading good books should be the work of reading class. That is how we help children fall in love with books. And once you help children fall in love with books, 98% of your job is done. Social interaction and conversation around good books. That was mentioned in the ILA. Uh, P. David Pearson mentioned the important, uh, Robert Tierney, I think the name is. Mention the importance of all learning is found within a social context. Literacy is a social process. The author is interacting with the readers, but it's enhanced when readers can interact with each other. We like to talk about the good books we read, just like we like to talk about the movies we've read. How many of you gone into a bookstore? You see a book that you've read and you have to go over there and touch it and say, ah, I read that book. That's a great book. Social interactions around books and writing enhances high level thinking, literacy learning, and enables students to learn content knowledge more deeply. Absolutely. High level thinking. Here's some high level thinking for you. If we teach only low level skills in our reading classes, only low level learning occurs. And what do we often give our Struggling readers, lots and lots of low-level skills instruction, and we wonder why. Scores on, on using the higher-level skills sometimes go down. Here are just some of the activities to develop social interaction. Book talks. Book talk, I use them in my undergraduate class. You simply tell about a book that you like. 15 seconds to no more than two minutes. It's not a book report. You just hold it up and say, this is a book and this is why I like it. Literature circles, book clubs, evaluations and critiques, just like the movie raters, the movie critics, a book critic. Top 10 lists. These are the top 10 that our class voted on. Journal entries and responses, and these are just some of them, planned discussions. Stepping off the stage, Students talking about books is a good thing. Gives the teacher a chance 
to step off the stage and observe your students learning. Authentic writing experiences. This is where the student is writing to share his or her ideas or experiences. Not replying to a prompt, but his or her ideas. And that connection is well established. These are just some of the sources used to describe the importance how reading develops writing and writing develops reading. Every reading class should have writing as a component of it. These need not be long activities. These can be short, three to 10 minutes. But writing is important in developing that letter sound connection and phonemic awareness. If you use temporary spelling in kindergarten, first grade, maybe even second grade, you can hear children sounding out the words wa, a, t, t, er, er is important. All right? Even if they don't get it spelled correctly. And in the five step writing process, Editing is step four, not step one. Temporary spelling does not mean we allow children to spell any way they want. Temporary spelling says, well, ideas are important, process is important. We edit on step, um, step four, not step one, two, or three. Writing is one of the best ways to develop the syntactic word recognition system. Syntax is grammar and word order. Syntax. As we read, this is called an interactive or transactive view of reading, data from the text goes to the thalamus. That's the relay station in our head. We use three, or knowledge as well, to uh, process this, and then it goes up to the cortex. However, brain imaging research has shown that there is almost 10 times more information flowing down from the head than flowing from the thalamus up to the cortex, meaning we use what's in our head to understand what we read. We can easily read about things we know a lot about. We struggle when we read things that are new to us. This head is full of literacy stuff. I can read most textbooks easily, quickly, with greater comprehension. When I read something about financial planning, same brain, no comprehension. I have to read very slowly and I struggle to make sense of it. Writing is one of the best ways to develop. Writing activities can be short, usually three minutes to 10. Usually pre-write, draft, and share with a partner. That is writing. Not every writing activity needs to be taken to the revision and editing stage. But writing is included. Authentic writing, sharing their ideas, describing their experiences. What do you want to say about what do you think will happen next? And comprehension instruction. That's one of the big five. And there's two parts to comprehension instruction cognitive processes, and study skill strategies. Cognitive processes are those thinking processes related to creating meaning with text. Scarborough calls it verbal reasoning. And ye, these are used with narrative texts. And they're things like predicting and inferring cause effect supporting statements. And I recommend that graphic organizers be used to teach these. We teach the process to develop the skill, meaning we teach this predicting, not so they can fill out our graphic organizer, but so they begin to do it automatically as they're reading. We teach inference so they do it automatically. We develop the cognitive process. We teach cause, effect, and supporting statements so they do it automatically as they read. These are the types of graphic organizers I like to do. Predicting is not simply making a guess, it's making a guess based on clues. Prediction question, what do you think will happen? Clues, write the page, and then the prediction. This 
is the process used. Same with inference, the inference question, the clues, and your inference. I like using these graphic organizers. They can do this in a journal or a reading log. Cause effect, given the effect, what was the cause? Given the cause, what was the effect? They fill this out. Doing these over time develops. It's the strategy, it develops the skill. So they began to do this automatically. Study skill strategies. We read textbooks differently than we read a narrative text. I read Harry Potter different, differently than how I read the book on brain imaging research. I needed to use some strategy, a study skill strategy. And we teach them explicitly. These are just seven of them. But I recommend that you find the ones that work best for you and your students. Could be maybe one or two of these, or maybe all of them. Teach them explicitly. These are the steps you demonstrate, you model, you practice. When it comes time to read, you say, boys and girls, we'll be reading chapter seven. Make sure you use one of the study skill strategies to help you understand what you're reading. Absolutely, that should be part of reading instruction. I forget who it was, but uh, they said, uh, oh, I'm just looking at the chat. Uh, they said that, they said, I forget which article, but oh, it's Allington that said that uh, comprehension is one of the mis most misunderinstructed elements of reading. We don't teach it correctly. We don't teach the process, the cognitive processes, and we certainly don't teach study skill strategies. Many of my students come to me as undergraduate students, and they still don't know how to read a textbook. You must teach that. And activities to develop word knowledge, vocabulary. And there are a lot of different vocabulary activities. But here's the thing. Children learn between, depending on the study, 3,000 to 5,000 new words a year. Now, they don't learn these by writing definitions. They don't learn these by doing vocabulary worksheets. Vocabulary worksheets are relatively ineffective for getting new words into students' vocabulary. There are a variety of strategies, and these are described in my book, to add depth and dimension. But the best one is wide reading and then immerse students in sophisticated conversations. We learn our words in context. Vocabulary, attending to vocabulary, has to be planned and purposeful. Yes, sometimes it's important to have formal instruction, but planned and purposeful ways to infuse these new words within the curriculum. Part of it is something as simple as having a writing prompt related to the new word, having a discussion prompt related to the new word, just seeing and hearing the word over time. Ah, the affective element, emotions, and motivation. We think and we emote with the same brain. It stands to reason that one would impact the other. As a matter of fact, there's quite a bit of research that says that emotions do impact our ability to learn. There are six basic human emotions. Emotions are a physiological response. All the others are deriva uh, derivations of these basic six. Positive emotions enhance learning. Negative emotions impede learning. So you can say spending some time on that self-esteem or feeling good about class, that's a research-based strategy. There is research to say that a positive nurturing classroom environment impacts learning. If children are afraid, if they're afraid of failure, if they're uh, afraid of looking stupid, that is going to impede learning no matter what curriculum you use positive emotion. Now, let's look at uh, behavioral psychology association. If you enjoy reading class, if you do fun things in reading class, 
you begin to associate reading with pleasurable things. You're more likely to do it if you associate your reading class. That's why it's so important to read good books, to have good discussions, to have fun in reading class. So you begin to associate reading with something positive. If you associate it with something negative, you hate doing it, you're made to feel like a failure, this is boring, all we do is drill and skill. Well, who's going to want to do that? You begin to associate reading with something negative. Stop frustrating, humiliating, and boring our kids. That's probably rule number two. Don't frustrate. If students can't do it, give them the scaffolding so they can do it. Or maybe lower it a little bit. Students should be able to practice reading using books at their independent level or below. These uh, uh, accelerated readers that always challenge students, that students have to read at their grade level or above, I say poppycock. You and I aren't assigned levels. I love reading easy books. I love reading young adult literature. It's the amount of words that are poured over the student's head, not the level. Yes, there are places and times to read expository books at a certain level, but for reading practice and enjoyment, for goodness sakes, there's nothing wrong with an easy book. We read them all the time. Make it acceptable to read easy books. Stop using the one-size-fits-all curriculums or approaches. And that's what I'm afraid of with the science of reading curriculum. They're going to have one curriculum that the teacher has to implement with fidelity. And kids are not standardized products. Some kids don't need a lot of phonics. Some students do. We cannot expect a standardized approach to work for all or even most of our students. We need to be able to differentiate. There are no magic programs. There are only magic teachers with teacher toolboxes filled with research-based strategies. And we want creative, intelligent teachers in our classroom. We must allow them to be creative and intelligent. Use your professional knowledge. Use the students in front of you. You, more, you know more than some person who designed that curriculum miles away. And with our students, there's differences. That's called being human. You know, some of this legislation where every student will read at grade level, that is absolutely silly. Think of the bell-shaped curve. Yes. We want to enable all students to develop their full literacy potential, but in any normal population, 50% are going to be above the mean, 50% are going to be below the mean. To insist that everyone should read at grade level, that just means that the average grade level will go up and students will continue to fail. It is okay to set different goals. Maybe your goal is to read three books and do a book talk this month. For other students, it may be read 17 books, but we set different goals for different students. Also, teaching within the zone of proximal development. This is a basic thing. The, this is the level that student, independent level, students can do it independently without any help. The frustration level means they can't do it, even with teacher help. The zone right between zone of proximal development, we want to get just ahead of where our students are at, provide some sort of scaffold to enable them to be successful. One way to do this, of course, scaffolded oral, uh, scaffolded reading, is where you introduce a book, you have a pre-reading activity that creates a scaffold, tells the student what's going to be in the book, and enables them to read successfully. These are the 10 pillars of comprehensive literacy instruction. I can take some questions now or comments, or I can take them after I have just a brief thing on what, on what a reading intervention should be. Culturally responsive. Okay, uh, does someone have a question they'd like to ask? I see there is a discussion here going on. 
and if so, feel free to uh, pipe up or raise your hand. Okay. I don't see any hands raised, uh, but if you have a question, just turn your mic off and jump right in. I want to just look briefly then at what are the elements of a comprehensive or an effective reading intervention. Think what a reading intervention, any intervention, a drug and alcohol intervention. It's not meant to be forever. It's meant to be temporary. Someone has a problem, you intervene, and hopefully they get better. The role of an intervention is for that intervention teacher to become obsolete. That's the goal. It's not meant to be a forever sort of thing. Now, there are three deficit areas in reading. Fluency, word identification or recognition, and comprehension. All students are not the same. Some struggle with just one, some two, some all three of them. And if a student is struggling with fluency, why in heaven's name are you addressing word identification if that's not a problem? The same with comprehension. So having a good diagnostic, and I strongly recommend some type of qualitative reading inventory, is key to designing important or effective interventions. Intervention should be briskly paced, quick, series of short activities, not just one, and 15 to 40 minutes, depending if you're doing RTI, three days a week minimum for tier two, five days a week, four or five for tier number three. But it should have a series of either four, sometimes even six activities, briskly paced with a little pause in between. Keep in mind that students can really focus for a short amount of time. If you want to keep them engaged, briskly paced, short amount, pause and process, briskly paced, short amount, pause and process. That's what an intervention should be. It should enhance what you're already doing. It should not replace good classroom instruction. It should look similar. We want to do, we want to build on what that classroom teacher is doing. Now imagine if you were teaching someone to play tennis and you showed them one way to swing the racket in the morning and another teacher showed them another in the afternoon. That would be a splintered curriculum where you're doing different things in different parts about reading. We want it to be cohesive. Absolutely, there should be word work if that's a deficit area and it should include all those things. Absolutely, it should include word identification if that's a deficit area, and it often is. Maze and close, these are the best for developing the semantic cueing system. You read a sentence, it has the beginning letter, they use this to fill in the blanks, and then they read the complete sentence. So I like to use a PowerPoint with this. She tried her best to blank softball. And I these take two to eight minutes a day. We do them quickly. It develops the ability to let their eyes bounce on both sides of the word. Yes, they're still using letter clues. And if I really, if I want to, I can reinforce letter sounds. I can have a lot of short A words in here. But this develops the semantic. This is called a, uh, a maze. Uh, a sentence with, oops, sorry with either two or three alternatives. She hit it and they have to pick the right one. And again, usually uh, two to eight minutes, six to 10 of these very quickly, a short part of practice. Comprehension processes, we already talked about that. Self-selected reading, we already talked about that. Books that they have chosen, independent level or below. There are a lot of good high, low books out there. Academic Therapy Press or High Noon Books has some good stuff out there. These are decodable books, chapter books for students in grades three and above. That's written at the third grade level. There's so many good books written for struggling readers. And it's okay to read easy books, chapter books. And fluency activities. I didn't develop, I didn't, uh, uh, I didn't uh, hit on this too much, but repeated reading activities, 
scaffolded oral reading and choral and echo reading are just some of the activities. And then writing, of course, and language experience approaches. All right, I'm going to stop it right there and see, oh, look at we all, I can see you out there. All right, do you have any questions or comments or things you want to say at this point? Mary Howard, yes. I was having a little trouble turning off my button. Um, I just first wanted to tell you how much I appreciate uh, the 10 pillars. I love that you're widening, widening the breadth of what we feel is important. And I think one of the problems that we're seeing right now is that even with the five pillars, we're narrowing it even more. So after you finished that, I love that you went into talking about interventions. And so my question is this because I know you know how important all the thing, all the 10 that we talk about for all of our children, I think we should be talking about louder or as loud when we're talking about our intervention kids. So, and what happens in interventions so often is that we do that, let's shrink it down and let's only work on this one thing. So how do we help schools and teachers understand that when we're working in those interventions, we are not watering down or uh, narrowing what we do, that all 10 of those are just as important. And by the way, probably reading every day, even more so than any of those. Absolutely. I agree. We need to do that. Does anyone have any answers to that very complex problem? I will tell you this, Mary. I will certainly reinforce that point in my talks, in my books, and in future webinars. You put it so aptly. We tend to narrow it down thinking they're gonna get better. They don't need they don't need more of one thing, they need a lot of all things. Yeah. Other good ideas or questions or comments. I'll just add to what Mary said, and it's more of a concern, and, and hearing you address it is just really on point. So many schools now, because they've had this extra money, this influx of money, instead of hiring reading teachers or hiring educational tutors, and they are people with no training at all, and what I find is that the kids who are most at risk are the children who are sent to the least trained person to provide instruction for the neediest child. So as you're addressing these things, it's just the expertise that it requires to do these things. Um, I just really appreciate it. And teachers, uh, students need to be in an inclusive class with a general ed teacher. Research is pretty clear that students don't make the progress in a special ed resource room that they do in a general ed classroom. And the training that a special education teacher receives is much different, much less on literacy instruction. But here in the state of Minnesota, the wise ones decided that special ed teachers are automatically reading experts. Being a direct instruction expert is much different from being a reading expert. Absolutely. And we need to push back. We need to push back. We want our creative, intelligent teachers. We need to let them be creative and intelligent. Anyone can follow a teacher's manual. It takes a teacher to teach. Don't get me Can there. I? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Mary Beth, thank you. Um, I just was wondering, okay. I am newly here from Wisconsin, and um, I don't know if you know anything about the Wisconsin State Reading Association. I do. Okay, so I come from a very thriving, um, they they have like their position statements, and they would completely agree with you. Now I come to Minnesota, I just moved here last spring and I worked as a reading specialist and um, published articles and things like that in, in Wisconsin, but I come to Minnesota, um, I don't see anything going on with the, am, am I right in seeing this? Maybe I should ask you. 
Minnesota Reading Association. I don't see anything going on there. They used to have conferences at Hamlin University. I don't see that going on anymore. Um, I am looking at some of the sub groups of the Minnesota Reading Association and they're doing, seems like they're doing a lot with science of reading. Um, what, can you explain to me what happened? What's, why is this so different than Wisconsin where they're supporting, they're doing, at least when I left, they were doing more support of your way of thinking? Right. I don't think it's that way now. I know the International Dyslexia Association really gummed up the works over there. Okay. And okay. These are for-profit organizations. Let's make no mistake about it. And there's nothing wrong with making a profit. But Orton Gillingham, you have to pay four to five grand a course, letters mm -hmm. training. Who's making money there off the backs of our struggling readers? Minnesota just spent a hundred million dollars on this read act. That could have gone to reducing class sizes, buying good books for kids, giving them breakfast and health insurance. Instead, it's going to make these the educational industrial complex richer. Now there's nothing wrong with making money. There are some good publishers like Richard Owen up there who publishes good books, a shout out to you. But I appreciate what he's publishing. Uh, I don't know if that answered your question. I would like groups like the International Literacy Association and our teachers unions to speak out. And I think they've been far too silent. Okay. I haven't gone to the Minnesota Reading Co uh, Conference in quite a while. Well, they don't have it anymore, what I'm understanding. Maybe it's yeah. because I stopped going. No, I don't know why. Okay. But it's a, it's a shame that they stopped doing that. Other ideas or things to share? I have one thing. Yes, Helen. Um, I just wanted to say that I appreciated when you said that, um, you know, the role of the uh, intervention and the intervention teacher should eventually just not be needed anymore. And I think what I tend to see is that, um, some interventions and some approaches seem to be permanent yes. things for children. They start very early in their school career and keep going throughout. So I think that that's something that's not understood very well. And the, the need for acceleration and intensive instruction, like you described, not just a little bit of dabbling or one particular um, you know, aspect of the reading. It, I, I feel like those are really misunderstood. So I just wanted to say I appreciated that. No question. Wonderful. What yeah. about pushing? Oops. Are you, is anybody, are you, um, I, I felt like um, I was doing action research when I left Wisconsin. We had to move here because my husband wanted to farm. Um, I was seeing a lot of, I, did a lot of, I started out um, doing canned, I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't call them canned interventions. Um, scripted interventions is probably a better way to explain it. And I was seeing, um, I was seeing some good things happening when we started pushing into, instead of having our little um, classrooms and having taking the kids out of their English classes and things like that. We started pushing in to the um, classrooms, like the English classrooms, and I started seeing growth with at least my students. Are you seeing anything or hearing anything about push in? I'll respond and then I'll call on Ann because she had her hand up. Uh, okay. It's quite clear from the research I've looked that pull out does not work. Mm -hmm. Students learn more and they develop more uh, emotional, they, they progress emotionally and socially if they're with their peers. This idea that you pull them out and separate and slow it down just doesn't work. And there's a lot of research to show that doesn't work. And you had an idea. Hi, Andrew. I saw you first on um, Sam. 
Paul Morito is a friend of mine oh, in, in Missouri, and he interviewed you recently. Uh, um, I come at it just trying to learn from all of you reading specialists, professors, and uh, I come at it from a different point of view of the neuroscience of, of reading. Uh, they keep saying the science of reading, which I think, as you say, you know, there's many sciences. It's really the science of brain development. And so I'm wondering, I put it in the chat, but I'll read it. One third of students appear to learn to read well, no matter which way they're taught, but two thirds do not. What if there's a hidden missing link in their brain development? And what if we address that before they get to school and we wouldn't have to have much intervention? It, what it is to me is uh, I come at it from a music teacher point of view. It's auditory processing. And brain research has found that auditory processing is highly correlated with reading achievement. But most reading interventionists are not working with brain development. They're, they're working with strategies with children who are struggling to read. What if we looked at it from a brain point of view? For example, children who cannot keep a steady beat are likely to struggle with reading. So when I teach classroom teachers, which I, I've done since 2005 in Minneapolis public schools, their QCOMP Prope courses, they're like, what? I've never heard that. I said, well, yeah, go back to your third grade class and have them close their eyes so they can't imprint, they can't see visually and watch a visual motion. They have to do it auditorily and keep a steady beat on their laps and sing twinkle, twinkle. And they'll come back to the next class and they go, oh my gosh, half of my kids can't keep a beat. I said, yeah, it's not a magic pill, but it's a foundational skill the brain needs. And without it, they're likely to struggle with reading, according to the neuroscientists. So I'm wondering if intervention specialists are at all aware of the brain research that in the last 10 years has been, there's a large accumulation of it. And I don't think we're translating that to the interventionists. Everyone agrees that an early intervention is important. That's why the uh, uh, program, I forget what it is, getting preschool kids and their parents reading at age three, four, and five, uh, the name escapes me, brain fart moment, is important. The best predictor of reading is child's vocabulary. Vocabulary. Meaning they have been immersed in language and comprehension. And what happens when budgets get tight? We cut the arts program. Think about the brain as a series of neurons connecting up. And the more neurons and connections you have, the more you can learn. And art connects your neurons differently and expands it. This is our learning organ. And I agree with you. There is a lot to learn from its basic science, but from brain imaging. And there's been some marvelous articles written on that. Yes. But the arts, we need to keep them in our schools. That's what enhances learning, expanding that thing. Yeah, and I think um, the new, uh, we're, we're a nonprofit in, in the Minneapolis area called Rock and Read Project. And we had 600,000 from the legislature. And we use a software, a singing-based software. And there's four or five controlled research studies about it. And uh, we help 2,500 children. And in 14 hours of singing songs repeatedly, repeated reading with pitch and rhythm, being rewarded for the pitch and rhythm part, um, they go up on average one year reading achievement on the MCAs. That's our state test, right? So we can't get schools to use it even though they saw the data because I think they don't quite understand. We don't can't see in here. So they're like, what? 14 hours, one year reading achievement. I'll say it's the fastest. We don't own this software and we're not doing it anymore because we can't get schools to use it. But I'll say it's the fastest intervention out there. So it's skill-based. It's something in the brain that is actually changing. So I don't think we're outfitted as a society yet to look at this or... Uh, so anyway, I, I just, I, I'm struggling for how to reach to reading folk and go, this is really big, but nobody quite, we don't quite know what to do with it. Other ideas? I write up, do some research, write it up, send it in for an article, get it peer reviewed. Actually, I did. I, I got an article in the ILA with, with Sam Bomarito and um, 
Tim Rosinski, the three of us put an article in. And so uh, we're getting some publish publish about it because, you know, Tim Rosinski has been a big fan of singing and so is Sam. But nobody's really looked at the brain science yet, connected the brain science with why these kids are struggling. But I'm totally with you. I mean, the pendulum is swung to the, that there's only one science of reading. And I'm like, no. <laughs> science is a reading. Yeah, yeah, I'm totally with you on that. Uh, other ideas. There, there is quite a bit written about brain imaging research. And in my book, one of them is called Brain a, a based approach to reading instruction, my first one. And it's so bad that I forget the names of my books. Am I getting old? <laughs> 10 Essential Elements for Students with Reading Difficulties, a Brain Friendly Approach. Uh huh. I'm getting old. I forget the title of my books. But that is based strongly in brain imaging research, neurocognitive neuroscience. Absolutely. Yeah, the, the newest science is. Uh, Frequency following response. It's not where the brain lights up like MRIs. It's how the brain actually processes sound on a number of different quadrants. In fact, they show, I mean, it's just, it's pretty amazing. But I think, you know, I'm talking to these scientists and they're like, we're scientists. We can't get this to the teachers. They're scientists. So yeah. my, my goal is like, okay, well, how can I get, how can I communicate this in a way that we could take some action on it, at least as a state. And I don't know. When we look at research, we have to uh, look at a wide body of research. The eye movement research and the miscue analysis research are just as important as the brain imaging research to tell us about reading online. The That's same with the psycholinguistic priming mm -hmm. studies. They all support the semantic and syntactic cueing systems. Absolutely. Is there someone else with an idea or a question? Copies of my slides. Oh, gosh, I forget. I don't know how I send you copies of my slides, but I'm going to put my my email in there. You can certainly, certainly send me an email, and I'll send you a copy of my slides. Um, what about creating, like, a Google folder in a drive that we all can access different, like maybe other people might have something they can offer and then it's all in one central location and we share the folder for Google Drive. Brilliant, brilliant. If uh, I'll set one up, you send me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you. I do have a Facebook page, International Literacy Educators Coalition, and I can leave stuff there as well. Just go on there and message me. Any other questions? I, uh, I have a question with regards to decodable books. Yeah, good question. Um, I am not quite sure in your area of what what's happening in classrooms, but um, it appears that many classrooms in our area are pushing for more decodable books and uh, possibly even the removal of other types of uh, of books, classroom for classroom library, because of um, students not. Um, you know, perhaps not being able to read those books. Maybe the proper word would be decode those books. So, um, you know, I, in my opinion, there should be some sort of balance or some, you know, uh, some, a variety of books for all our learners. But I just want, wanted to hear some insight uh, on, on decodable books from, from everyone. First of all, uh, there's nothing wrong with the decodable book. My thinking on that has changed. As long as they're used as one part and in the context of lots and lots and lots of good books. Reading is not sounding out words. Reading is creating meaning with print. Without meaning, you're not reading. Almost every kid can read the first day of kindergarten. And you're gonna, what? Absolutely creating meaning. They may use more picture clues than word clues, but they are creating meaning. They can go through it. 
this idea that if they look at the pictures, they won't learn to read, that's just nonsense and gobbledygook. We must make decisions on science, not on I thinkisms, personal anecdotes, and experience. Science is used to get beyond our personal perceptions. And too often, especially in the science of reading uh, area, people are using their own experience, or I talked to teachers, or this parent said, to make decisions, $100 million decisions. That is kooky talk, people. Pardon my very technical language. But absolutely, there's nothing wrong with decodable books. They can be a valuable resource. And I've, I've used them myself in my tutoring, absolutely. And Andy, you said at the very, very beginning, which I think is so important when we talk about anything, it's not, uh, how did you put it? It's not what, but um, how With long, how much. how much. And I think that's the thing for us to understand about decodable books. It's not throw all the decodable books away, but what's happening is they're not only a steady diet, but they go on much longer. And in the P. David Pearson, Robert Tierney session today, they talked about uh, the research support for predictable books. Um, so I think what scares me and, and what I hear you saying is what I hear a lot of places. What scares me is that we want to, uh, it's, it's like an all or none. We're going to do all of this and we're not going to do any of that. Um, and that, that's disconcerting that we, you know, it comes back to that, like you said, it's, it's how much. And if the answer were, if it were a simple answer, if it were one thing, don't you think the International Literacy Association mm -hmm. and the National Council of Teachers of English with thousands of research over decades would have come up with that answer? If teaching more phonics worked, my next book would be called Teaching More Phonics. <laughs> yes, Richard. I'm wondering what's happening today in the classroom with regard to, and, and I'm going to use the word uh, assessment. I'm not even sure that's the right word, but for 20 years or more, it's 30 years, uh, it has seemed to me that that um, miscue analysis and running records have both served some real important it's important information for the teacher to guide the teacher in what to do next and how to support and help a child. What's happening to that? And if they aren't doing those, what are they doing? It's the publishing companies who are million dollar entities. I agree with you. Miscue analysis, running records, and I would put maze to, to look at comprehension. Those are the three. All the standardized stuff is gobbledygook. I get a page back, a printout, and I go, okay, based on this, what should I do tomorrow? Oh, they have short-term memory deficits? That doesn't tell me what to teach. A miscue analysis and a maze and running record. I insist, that's what I do whenever I uh, start tutoring a kid. That gives a good teacher all the information they need to teach. How can we get the rest of the profession to buy back into that? Uh, yes, that's that's a good question. Richard, if you figure that out, uh, <laughs> I will put a statue of you in my front yard. Oh, thank you. <laughs> a lawn ornament. <laughs> You know uh, what, I, I'll just mention that there's a lot of work being done by the Reading and Recovery Council of North America and their um, uh, their hub for um, action re research. And they're working on um, some, some modifications to running records mm -hmm. that I think are really promising and really describe more than just sources of information, but like what those brain processes are that children are are using the strategic actions that they use when they're reading i feel like that that might be something <laughs> i know that reading recovery teachers are excited about it and i hope that this will become something that becomes more widely available 
Mm. And how can we give teachers more of a voice, get them printing in our professional journals, action research projects. And part of yeah. the job, being a teacher is hard work. Most teachers don't have time to sit and write after eight, 10 hours. I know I certainly didn't. Mm. Other ideas or things to put forth here. I cannot I, tell I have, Sorry, I have uh, another uh, question with regards to, uh, say, speech language pathologists and uh, other perhaps um, specialists within our, that work within our schools to support students. Um, are, are many of your schools seeing um, such roles, um, perhaps taking over in the sense of they being viewed as reading specialists now over teachers? Someone want to jump in before I slather all over that one? Could you say that question one more time? She's wondering. Sure. Um, oops, sorry. With no. regards to speech language pathologists being uh, perceived as being reading specialists within our schools or having uh, a greater voice um, with regards to being reading interventionists or reading specialists over teachers who have been teaching or specializing in reading instru instruction for a number of years. I don't know how that happened. On our campus, we have a speech comm department. And they see themselves as reading specialists. They even do diagnostics and they decide a kid is dyslexic based on a goofy ass test. Mm -hmm. And I read their test and it's obvious they know nothing about reading instruction. And I look at their intervention. I was part of it until I threw up my hands in horror. They just do some commercial program. So I don't know how a speech and language specialist becomes a reading specialist. What magic wand is waved over them to know about literacy? You know, I've spent 35 years of my life reading about literacy, and I am not where I want to be. I'm still asking questions. So how do you t take a class or two and suddenly become a reading expert? I don't understand why the speech and language people are allowed to have input on reading instruction. Should we ask a, a elementary teacher to tell them how to do speech and language? For goodness sakes. That's my opinion. Thank well, you, the, I appreciate that. One of the issues I think that we're having and why it's so important to have these conversations too is that we tend to look at um look at those interventions that that reading specialist or whoever is doing as the fix-it room let's go send them to them and they're going to fix them as opposed to one of my ap absolute favorite books is um and processes is a uh, comprehensive intervention model that was initially created by Linda Dorn. And the beauty of that book, which is grounded in reading recovery, is that the only intervention we can focus on is a broad-based everybody. This is not your child, and we're not going to send them to the fix-it room. This is our child and we are all responsible. So in, in context to the question about uh, the speech uh, language, I think that we are never going to see the benefits of what we're doing and the understandings that you're talking about so eloquently today, Andy, until we stop looking at these kids get this and these kids get this and don't ask me about these kids because they're not my kids um, until we all join forces and we all work with kids all together. And that's the beauty of comprehensive intervention model. I don't know if any of you have MTSS in your states, multi-tiered systematic systems of support. That's splinter it even more and adding behaviorism into the mix. Yep. Other ideas. 
All right. It has been, I'm going to wrap it up here. It has been a joy to actually see you and hear you. And I will definitely do a Zoom class again. This has been, uh, Yay. It, it has been good. So if you have, uh, so I will post, you will see me online and I'll, I'll send you stuff when I'm ready to do another one. So thank you. I enjoyed your ideas and thank you for being good teachers of reading. I know it's mm -hmm. tough work. Good night all. Thank you.